I've been thinking about power and Americans' place in the world for about the last two decades. And this new book that I've written, The Future of Power, tries to project that work forward another two decades into the future. The basic argument of the book is that power, the ability to get others to do the things you want, uh, is changing, or the mix of things that make power is changing in the 21st century. Traditionally, we often thought of power in terms of military power. The great A.J.P. Taylor, an Oxford historian, wrote that the mark of a great power is the ability to prevail in war. But in an information age, it's often not just whose army wins, it's also whose story wins. And that means that to cope well with the global information age of the 21st century, we have to think not only of hard power, of coercion and payments, but the soft power of narrative attraction and persuasion. There are two huge shifts going on in power in this century. One is the shift from west to east, which you might think of as the recovery of Asia. Sometimes people call this rise of China. It really starts with Japan and it goes on to Korea, Southeast Asian countries, now it's China, it will soon be India, so that by somewhere in the middle of this century, Asia will be back to half the world's population and half the world's product that it was before the Industrial Revolution changed things in the 19th century. That leads us to have to think of how we cope with the rise of China to make sure that we realize that there's room for cooperation there. There's power with others as well as power over others. But there are misunderstandings that could get this off track. The other big shift in power in the 21st century is what I call power diffusion. The shift of power away from all states, whether east or west, to non-state actors. And this is a product of the information revolution. The dramatic reduction in the price of computing and communication over the last quarter century of the last century. The price of computing power dropped from about a, a thousandfold from 1970 to 2000. And one way to put that, fix that in your mind, is that the price of an automobile had dropped in an equivalent way. You could buy a car today for $5. Anytime you reduce the price of something that much, you reduce the barriers to entry. So even though governments remain the most important actors, there's a much more crowded world stage. All sorts of people can play who couldn't in the past. Indeed, as you look at the events in the Middle East, uh, in Egypt, Tunisia, and elsewhere, part of this is a product of this diffusion of power. And if we look at the issue of cyber power, and I have a chapter in the book on cyber power, uh, it raises a lot of questions. How do you defend yourself? What does deterrence mean if you don't know who's attacking you? Uh, for example, and there's a wonderful internet cartoon in the New Yorker from years ago that says two dogs talking to each other and says, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Well, somebody could shut down the electrical system in February, or somebody can steal your intellectual property by the truckload by sending electrons across your border rather than actually invading you, and you won't know who did it. Was it an individual, a group of hackers, a criminal network, a terrorist group, or another government. This raises enormous new sets of problems in how we think about power in this century. In short, we as a people are going to have to realize that we've got to get away from this simplistic view of power is hard power only. Power is more than bombs and bullets. It's hard power and soft power and learning how to combine them into strategies of smart power. If we are able to do that, I think we can cope with this great power shift from west to east and the power shift from governments to non-governmental actors that mark the 21st century, but we still have a long way to go, and that's why I wrote this book. Thanks.